<clears throat> Hello. Uh, uh, today we'll talk about uh, uh, an important uh, Japanese architect, uh, Hiroshi Hara. Uh, let's uh, let's uh, see some pictures with this architect uh, in his older age, but he doesn't look old, uh, except that his uh, his hair is um, is white. But um, I like the you know the ambiance in his uh, in his office with all those models and so on. Here he was as a young man, uh, young and restless, perhaps architectural theory now, like other Japanese architects, he was very preoccupied with the theoretical aspects of architecture. And this is very common in Japan, where, uh, you know, creative architects, meaning those who deserve the name of architects, uh, also have preoccupations um, concerns with uh, what we call a uh, theory. Uh, I don't know who the one on the left is, but the one in the middle is uh, Arata Isozaki, and the one on the right, uh, uh, the architect we talk about uh, today. We start with, um, uh, let me just see, if I, unfortunately it doesn't, I don't say, I don't see the year when he was born. Anyway, we start with his own house, the Hara house in Tokyo, uh, 1974. Uh, at that time, already one could could feel that there were some uh, signs of the of the incoming postmodernism. In my opinion, although in although in 1974 it was a little bit early, but I would say that uh, uh, there is a certain formalism which was then uh, uh, maybe exacerbated in the following years, uh, towards the end of the 70s and early 80s, um, because of uh, that uh, um, subsidiary style, as uh, Patrick Schumacher calls it, the postmodernism. He identified two, postmodernism and deconstructivism. Anyway, this is from 1974. Uh, Japan was already a uh, a powerful uh, economic power, uh, very powerful. And uh, in architecture, this was shown that, uh, you know, they, they experimented a lot. And um, the Hiroshi Hara was not the only one. You see a perfect symmetry, uh, almost uh, alarmingly perfect, but um, uh, you know, it, it shows the will of the creator because architecture in general is the expression, with, with the exception of what's happening uh, very, very close to our time when uh, one also talks about um, chains architecture or hazardous architecture uh, or, uh, you know, uh, found architectures. This was a willful architecture. In other, word, the, in other words, the will of the architect is very clearly present. The design design decisions were taken in a willful willful way, and this symmetry itself is an expression of will. Um, I hope you can hear me because I receive here a message that now you you can. Now you can see the screen. Do you see the screen or not? Yes. Okay. The Ito House from 1967, so we earlier. Um, yeah, it's a cube. But, uh, and you see, he built another one. So I guess he repeated uh, the same architecture at least two times. Uh, yes, it's a cube, but it's not truly rigid. I mean, it is a cube, but it's elevated from its uh, concrete base. And there is a certain level of playfulness. And we are going to witness other manifestations of this playfulness a little bit later. Uh, in, in Japan, the cube at that time was uh, almost like, a, like dice. You know, it was uh, several architects played with a cube almost like a child plays with the cubes. 
and, and, and they created all kinds of permutations, all kinds of uh, different configurations, starting with a cube. And what else do we see here? This almost floating cube. It is supported by those columns, white columns, but because of the, the glass on the first floor, the cube asserts itself very explicitly as a cube. So Hiroshi Hara said, if we try to explain the design of an African village only using images of buildings or our impressions, it wouldn't be enough. We need more theoretical support and logical explanations, and we stand the chance of finding the roots and the origins of settlements more easily. For this reason, we need a system of language. Now, in the 70s, uh, you know, there was this, uh, you know, concern with semiotics and so on. For instance, we use the theory of fields as it appears in mathematics and the physical sciences. If you want to create the space of a light field, we can select a certain topology of light. Architecture, when understood as a field conditions, comes close to urban planning, Hiroshihara. But this is kind of interesting where you, where you think of a building in terms of urban planning. But this was, this was known even by uh, Palladio, and maybe even before him, that a room was considered to, to, to have the same spirit of the whole house and the whole, whole house, the spirit of the whole street and the whole street or that segment of the, of the city or the town or even the village to express the spirit of the whole uh, settlement, be, be it a city or a village and vice versa. In other words, the city is is like a, a villa, a large villa, and the villa is like a small city. So the relationship between architecture, meaning a building and urban planning is, um, is um, has a certain level of fluidity, you know? So it's, it's the, same, the same kind of organization. You can think of a room where you place the, the furnitures, as an urban planner would place buildings within the uh, the area, the urban area he works in. So in this sense, again, a house is a small city or could be seen as a small city and the city could be seen as a large villa or a, a large house. Now, I don't know exactly what he did here. Again, he, he was uh, experimenting uh, theoretically, practically, I'm not really an expert in Hiroshi Hara. Maybe I should be since I, I have the chance to talk about him. But this is just an, to incite you, the, the audience, if you are interested in what you see and what you hear, to uh, continue to study and investigate uh, what uh, this presentation as an homage to him on his birthday uh, shows. Too bad sometimes uh, in Japan, the, I mean, the, the images of the works are uh, uh, displayed on, on Google images, uh, the very small resolution. Like that's why now we have these uh, pictures which are perhaps a little bit too small. Anyway, this is a house he was uh, working on, but we should not forget what he tried to say, plus the reference to mathematics. You know, it would be very interesting, I would say, to uh, enlarge your vocabulary, your architectural language through suggestions coming from other disciplines. And that's what uh, not only Hiroshi Hara, but other architects, and not only in Japan, of course, did and do. Because even Wolf Prick said, you know, if you only think of architecture, you will only get architecture. But if you I mean, what is it? Ne what is potentially negative in only getting architecture? As an architect, of course, you try to build a building, but to say that you only get only get a building or only get architecture, what else is to get? Maybe the other 
the other expectation, a larger one, would refer to that meta-architecture, as um, Volprix called it, a meta-architecture, in a way, architecture beyond architecture. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, other disciplines could help you to achieve or move in the direction of a meta-architecture. Of course, when you look at the building, you see a building here and you say, yeah, it's a building. You might like it, you might not like it. But when you read the theory behind it, maybe your perceptions, your understanding of it um, become uh, wider and deeper. So under a polyhedral roof, a free domain where the types and forms of action are easily determined, the curving prismatic space of the common living area has been designed to allow the best airflow. The roof has been designed according to a complex folded and convex system of units in the form of polyhedrons composed of triangular planes. Uh, I don't know what this, and it's not a very clear um, image, image. I don't even know why I have it here. The world of Yucatai, the porous body, the basic nature of architects, uh, architecture is in its holes. This is also very interesting. I don't know what Yucatai means. Maybe in Japan is, uh, I mean, I see the translation, the porous body. Uh, and this makes me also think of the works of Stephen Cole and other architects who talk about porosity. But it's very possible that there is some truth in this because I remember what even Frank Lloyd Wright said that in a certain way, I, I do not quote, um, uh, you know, rigorously, but his message was that perhaps architecture wouldn't be so difficult to do if it wasn't for the windows or the holes in the walls. So here we see the basic nature of architecture is in its holes. So I think it's worth, uh, worth uh, investigating what porous architecture could be or the porous body the world of Yucatai and the, 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 the meaning, the, the, the essence, the force, the, the consequences of, of, of the holes of architecture or the holes in architecture. Because you can take a cube, you create a cube, no, a perfect cube, but then you have to place the windows in those walls of the cubes. You can place them in, in many ways, practically in a, in a you know, infinite, uh, uh, you know, maybe not quite infinite, but no, I think, yes, you can, you can place the windows in so many ways, but which one is not, or which ways are not um, superfluous? This is a difficult question. And maybe Frank Lloyd Wright was correct. You know, architecture is not difficult to do if it wasn't for the windows. Where do you place the windows? Or where do you make the holes in, in what we call architecture, in the architectural body? Which, in, in apparently, through this concept uh, in Japan, Yukatai, should be porous. Uh, four cube houses, as I, as I mentioned earlier, uh, there were other architects, not just uh, Hiroshi Hara, who worked with um, uh, the cube, playing with a cube like a kid plays with a cube, uh, like, uh, like some, some players play with dice. And it is, it is a form of, it is a ludic uh, manipulation of the cube. Uh, he built also, not just in Japan, we are going to see uh, um, uh, some works he built also based on the cube in 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 other in uh, in other parts of the world. You see, it's essentially the same building, but with small uh, variations. It's a cube sitting on a pedestal on a base. Four cube houses, Hiroshi Hara. You know. Ginny Gang said that uh, if it wasn't uh, also, uh, if there wasn't also uh, an intellectual construct in life, uh, life would be boring. She says something like this, and I, I would say that in architecture as well, 
if it's just a manipulation of forms and no some theoretical uh, you know um, background it's possible that that uh, formal uh, gain if we are to call it so wouldn't be very satisfying for example when i was attending um, lectures at uh, columbia university in the 90s in new york city uh, the audience i mean the students in the in the avery um, auditorium and the uh, presenters were not very uh, uh, great fans of uh, frank gary because they thought that frank gary is just playing with forms and there wasn't really a, you know, some kind of uh, uh, speculative thinking behind all that uh, formal plane. Now, maybe in time they change their mind, I don't know. But it is true that, uh, you know, a, a theoretical, uh, um, you know, discourse parallel or even intersecting in some form with the built work creates a richer reality. So I would say that, yes, an architect who uh, you know, aspires towards a certain level of being an architect would welcome theory at all. After all, Alv Andrea Palladio, I mean, he built many buildings. Did he need to, to, to write also those four books on architecture? Why did he write them? And why did, um, you know, other architects uh, uh, in Renaissance or after Renaissance or in modern times also create, uh, you know, books, uh, theories, uh, systems of thinking and so on. Because the thinking related to the art or act of building is also important. Uh, yeah, this is a website where I, I took some of these uh, images from, you know, unsatisfying as they are because the, the, the resolution is not great. But we'll, sh we'll show other things by Hiroshi Hara uh, in, in, in better ways. The Tasaki Museum of Art in Karuizawa, Nagano, 1986. Uh, here we see a, a freeing form and we see a certain uh, dialectical relationship between angular forms and curved forms. So it's the conflict, the tension between the curve and, uh, and, 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 and the angles. 1986 was also a year when uh, postmodernism was still uh, making victims to the left and to the right. And uh, for example, this, uh, you know, these forms that he uses here, in my opinion, for my taste, and I am subjective, they are a little bit too pop, too, Yeah, I don't know. I, I I find them a little bit problematic, but this is my opinion, a subjective opinion. Because postmodernism aspired towards a certain architectural populism. How else to interpret uh, the appearance, the publication of a book like Learning from Las Vegas? Naha Municipal Jose Primary School, a school, 1987. Hiroshi Hara. Again, the pictures are not uh, truly great, but uh, here we also see a side that is uh, without sloping roof, at least from this side, we don't see the you know, the sloping roof from the other side we do. So there is a dialectical play here in the work of Hiroshi Hara, like we saw in the previous work. Yamato International in Ota, Tokyo, 1987. This is a large building, um, but it's a large building which, although it is monolithical, you can also see the uh, components meaning uh, the multitude which uh, contributes to the whole. So you have multiplicity in unity. And that's why the large volume is not actually uh, boring or, or crushing. It is a large building, but because of these variations, these fragmentations, 
you have the whole, but you also have variety, variety in unity, in other words. 1987 at the University of Tokyo until 1997. Uh, there we see some of his works, and we are going to see um, um, well, he died in he died in 2007. This presentation is a little bit different from other presentations by me. I usually start with a short biography. For some reason, in this case, I didn't. So he actually died at um, so 64 plus uh, seven, 73, no, uh, 71, uh, died at 71 in 2007. And here are shown some works by him, but he built others and we started with those uh, cubes and those houses that he built earlier. Here we only see the works from 1987 to, 2000, to 2007. Ito house we saw, we saw this one already, sorry. The Ida City Museum in Nagano Prefecture, 1988. Uh, it's a museum, 1988. When I mention postmodernism, it's because of these forms that he uses here on the first floor, you know, like here you see again the will to form of the architect. A little bit uh, decorative, a little bit capricious. Uh, here I would say there can be seen the effect of, of postmodernism and a certain effect of uh, an architectural populism, as I call it, which I find a little bit problematic. But the decorative shed that was promoted by Venturi I guess had an effect in Japan as well. But with the exception of what we see here, otherwise the building has, uh, you know, the vigor of a fresh uh, uh, expression of what uh, the architect wanted to express. It's just here on the first floor where in a certain way, the architecture um, mellows down a little bit. Another school, 1992, uh, I hope, I so regret I don't have um, uh, larger pictures. This is rather interesting with its, uh, you know, uh, it's almost like, a, uh, you know, a round, a round school. I like, I like the curvature on a large scale. Kind of unusual for, for a school building and, uh, you know, this uh, uh, scale, because you see it has uh, four, four floors. Uh, Library, 1998. Now you wonder, what is this balcony here? What, what is its function? Where does it go? So, you know, these, uh, these balconies are, uh, you know, maybe capriciously chosen in terms of size and location, but they are also an expression, I would say, or could be an expression of, 
of what knowledge is about. And the library is about knowledge, no? It's about breaking the box. It's about uh, metaphorically aspiring for something that is outside of yourself and outside of the building that you are in. So, you know, you could find symbolic meanings that uh, save in a way what otherwise you might criticize because it's too, uh, you know, uh, too capricious or um, superfluous. I think Voltaire was right when he understood that what we call the superfluous uh, has its own, at least sometimes has its own meaning and its own uh, raison d'etre. So the architect, in my opinion, cannot justify everything in terms of uh, strict functionality. You know, because because there is a subjective side, there is the ornament, there is a uh, the desire to transcend, you know, pure uh, uh, function. And as such, uh, architecture, I think, should be allowed here and there, from time to time at least, to become even, you know, I'm, I'm saying it with a smile, irresponsible. Hiroshima Municipal Motomachi High School, another high school from 2000s, a big, <laughs> a big high school indeed. Um, Sorry for the picture again. Uh, this is in Hiroshima. But this is how Hiroshima looked like, you know, after the dropping of the bomb. And after Hiroshima, as we know, uh, the bomb was dropped on Nagasaki. Uh, very sad. But, but although Hiroshima was like this in 1945, it became, a, you know, a reborn city. Look, another image from the criminal plane, probably, that dropped the bomb. I chose to show these images because I think we should do everything we can to oppose the war. In case of a deadly war, there are no real winners. You know, everybody loses. And uh, I'm surprised that, uh, you know, the invaders of Ukraine do not know this. Does Mr. Mr. Putin know of this? Did he ever see such pictures? Or such pictures? This is not very dissimilar from how Rotterdam in the Netherlands looked like after the Second World War. This is what so-called Homo sapiens does to himself. You know, we build and then we start wars and destroy everything. How could this be? Hiroshima. 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 But it could be Ukraine too. A kindergarten, Keisho kindergarten, also by Hiroshi Hara. A beach house, a cube. We already saw several cubes with a picture smaller than this one. But I mentioned this, you know, Again, it's a simple cube. No, it's executed impeccably. Uh, it's you see, even here, you know, a more conventional architect would have uh, um, covered the facade, this facade, with the pieces of wood, probably exactly like on the left side here, all the way to to this side. Why did he uh, place these at forty-five degrees, as opposed to this on the left side? Again, because in architecture, not everything can be uh, justified, uh, you know, rationally or logically. It was an aesthetical decision, and I don't think it was a wrong decision. The facade of the cube is more nuanced and more interesting in this way. Here he is, uh, I think, in Poland. Uh, he was invited uh, in Poland um, uh, to to lecture, and it moves me this picture. You know, it's probably 
some students talking with Hiroshi Hara. Uh, he smokes, they don't smoke in an informal setting. Very nice, you know, I mean, uh, we should have such dialogues, you know, all, all across uh, space and time, if possible. And look, he is, he is here in, uh, no, these are other, so it's Arata Isozaki, Peter Reisman, Toyo Ito, Tadao Ando, Rev Kolhas, and uh, Charles Jenks. I don't know why I, I introduced this picture here. See, uh, to be honest with you, I made this presentation a few years ago, and I'm surprised myself. Why did I include uh, these uh, people here in this presentation about Hiroshi Hara? I don't know. Sapporo Dome Stadium. So he built a small cube, but he also was able to build, look, a giant uh, uh, stadium, impeccably executed. I mean, uh, uh, constructed. Truly impeccably. I mean, I don't know how they are able to be like this. You know, it's, it's, it's. I mean, Brunkush, he, he polished a sculpture working years, you know, on it, a uh, small, uh, small uh, sculpture, you know, and then here is a huge building, which is as, um, you know, uh, perfectly executed, uh, like a uh, like a sculpture by Brunkush, and it's also an inhabited sculpture, because this was the definition of Brunkush that architecture is an inhabited um, uh, uh, sculpture. I don't think he was truly correct. Architecture is a little a little bit different from a sculpture. But sculpturalness does add to architecture. It is a, a exceptionally well uh, crafted architectural whale. And we see again the balcony, if we are to call it so enclosed as it is, springing from the roof of the building, maybe searching for the infinite, for the horizon, for the unknown. Of course, the, the pure prosaic functionalist would have said, we don't need this. Let's get rid of this, right? But, but a good architect is more than a morose, bored, strict, restrictive, and probably with a pathological inferiority complex functionalist. So this thing here, with its uh, superfluousness, has its beauty and uh, maybe even its meaning, superfluous as it is. But I mentioned this before, quoting from John Ruskin. It seems that the beauty of the tail of the peacock is superfluous, but is the most beautiful. And John Ruskin probably was right. You know, the most beautiful things in nature and in life are those that are the most useless. And you could say that this is useless too. Although I don't think it is, because uh, it is an enclosed space, it is used. You contemplate the sky, the, the infinite, the horizon. I don't know. Hiroshihara, a stadium. And now we arrive at, uh, um, uh, in my opinion, a beautiful work, the main train station in Kyoto. Kyoto being the city of, uh, you know, the, the spiritual center of, uh, of Japan. But this, I don't know actually, why did I include this here? I hope I will probably, I hope I come back to this because this is a very important work. Sorry about this. This presentation needs some, 
some work to, to, to improve. So this image is from the main train station in Kyoto. But I hope I show this work a little bit later. In the meantime, we still contemplate the uh, at the time when I created this presentation, I probably wanted to compare something, this this work, the stadium with the train station, but I forgot in the meantime what I wanted to say, by the way, of this. Anyway, I hope I'll show that work a little bit later. Again, the, uh, the stadium, an experimental house in Cordoba, Argentina, not in Spain. And this is an interesting work too, and it shows the playfulness of Hiroshi Hara. You know, it's a, it's a house composed of three uh, parts, each one ludically uh, conceived and with a, with a bridge connecting the three. Very, very playful, really. And not just chromatically, again, playing with a, with a cube. So we see here how he played with the windows and also with the doors, but particularly with the windows, the small windows. And here are the, the plans of the house. in out in out in so you know you see here the 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 love of the exterior that the that the japanese have so you know it, it's a house which is actually three houses so or or there are three houses that together form one house this can be seen also in some works by tadawan or Sukujimoto or kazuyo sejima they love the outside, but they also love the inside. So there is an interplay between the outside and the inside, a continuous interplay. Uh, this is a, a rendering at night. So again, this is in Argentina. Uh, here is the architect. a view inside one of these uh, three parts of the house in Argentina. Again, Hiroshi Hara with his friends in Poland. I like even this fact, you know, the, the students, I imagine they are students sitting on chairs while the architect sits on the, uh, you know, on the, on the deck. Now, yes, the Kyoto Railroad Station, a great work in my opinion. It's, you know, it's, <laughs> you could say it's the cathedral of, uh, of, uh, of uh, railways or the cathedral of, um, you know, train moving or the cathedral of uh, moving, uh, you know, I don't know how to call it, but it has this majestic, uh, uh, almost sacra sacred, uh, uh, you know, the space, the space itself is, uh, is maybe a metaphor for the crossing the threshold, the drama, the poetry, the expectations, the emotions of taking the train, of departing, you know, which I think everybody who used the train experienced in a train station, waiting for someone or waiting for the train to take you away. It's, it's, a, it's, 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 it's a special feeling that you have in a train station, maybe more than in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an airport. And here he, I mean, you know, Kyoto is Kyoto. Kyoto. 
very, very important city in uh, Japan and for the whole world. But we see that despite the fact that this is a, you know, a function, a very, you know, um, I don't want to say prosaic function because it's not prosaic, but this is not a temple. And maybe it's not a place where to dramatize the roofing the way he did. But he did so, I think, exactly because it is about this threshold, the threshold that you step over in order to leave or in order to arrive or both. And I think he did a great job because the public dimensions of this space, the collectiveness that the uh, uh, that uh, you know, uh, uh, railway in general expresses here is magnified at the scale of uh, maybe it's not just a metaphor for Kyoto, it's a metaphor for uh, all the railway stations in the world. It's 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 big. It's a big building, but he is able, like in other works that we saw by him, to problematize the what could have been a, a crashing monolith through fragmentation. And uh, yes, the, the, the space is, is giant, uh, but uh, because of these fragmentations, it become, becomes human and uh, maybe not domestic, but there is a, a balance between uh, you know, the big and the small, between the whole and the fragments. I like this train station. Well, towards the outside, this is not so apparent, but there is towards the outside also the, the ornamental treatment of, of certain uh, architectonic elements, like the, the stairs here on the right. You know, uh, they become ornamental. It's a design on the facade of the building that connects, you know, with other parts of the, of the general design. Uh, you could say it's capriciously done, yes. It's capriciously done, but I think uh, like the tail of the peacock uh, doesn't leave us indifferent uh, because, uh, uh, you know, form is part of architecture. And uh, if, if form is pleasant, uh, you know, the chance is that we appreciate it, of course. Alvaralto played with, uh, you know, the diagonals of, uh, of, of stairs or the motif of the stairs in a building he built, which I like very much. I don't have here the image, but uh, uh, again, Alvaralto showed the same thing, that you can transcend the, the uh, ad literam treatment of a function with a concern for beauty or rhythm or uh, yeah, aesthetical, aesthetical uh, elements. This is a city within a city, this train station, the Kyoto railway station. Hiroshihara. And look at this, you know, this, this strong, uh, urban, uh, large, uh, steep, uh, long diagonal with escalators and even stairs. I mean, you, you know, they might not have been necessary per se for their function, but for the metaphorical function, they are very necessary. It's about, again, crossing the threshold, stepping over, moving upwards or moving downwards. It's about movement. I think it's very impressive. And can you imagine how tall this interior is? I am sure you cannot be indifferent if you are to enter this uh, railway station in Kyoto. And it is a celebration of collectivity. I mean, you have multiplicity, or all, the, all the, this large number of people is composed, are composed of individuals like you and me. So there is the togetherness, there is the collect collectiveness or the collectivity or the collective, but there are also the members that compose this collectivity. So you have both variety and unity, multiplicity and unity. I think it's an excellent work. I'm surprised how 
generous it is in terms of space in a city which I'm sure is very, very, very dense. And Japan doesn't have so much space. But it seems they had space for this special, very special railway station in Kyoto. He also built a very special skyscraper, and we are going to see it uh, soon after this one. It's almost an imago mundi, this railway station, really. And look, there are people who actually climb those stairs, also, although there are escalators, as we saw them. Kyoto, Hiroshihara, the dynamics of architecture, the sculpturalness of architecture, the collectiveness of architecture, the publicness of architecture, but also the individuality of architecture. It's a big organism. It's a big architectural animal, this railway station. But I think it works. And here we see a detail which uh, echoes the house we saw built by him in Cordoba in Argentina. <laughs> I mean, if you get bored in Kyoto, which is probably impossible, but let's imagine you just go to the railway station and sit on, on, on a, you know, uh, on something there and just watch, you know, a uh, quintessential. Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, manifestation of, of life. Now, the Umeda Sky Building, that's what I was referring to, is not in Kyoto, it's in Osaka, the city of Tadawando. And it's, a, it's I think, I mean, it has a certain, uh, the architecture has some elements of what one might call commercial architecture. Because it's a, you know, it's a large office tower, but because of the sky element, Umeda sky building, and you'll understand why the word sky appears there. Look at this. So there, are, there are two towers that he connected with the bridge and with this unexpected uh, third element, the one that brings into a conjunction the two towers. And here we see the drama of Russian constructivism built. And so there is a certain idealism here, a certain utopianism that, that, that all of a sudden transforms a really uh, uh, building or two buildings that uh, in, in essence are corporate buildings no? and you know, consequent, consequently it's a commercial architecture into something else. All of a sudden, these towers, together with the element in between, what is at the top, uh, becomes something, something else. It's more than just a corporate architecture. And it's more because of that sky, those three letters, S, K, Y. All of a sudden, you realize that these buildings, which are on Earth, um, telluric, terrestrial, are not forgetting the sky, are not forgetting the celestial. And the celestial becomes even more uh, apparent because it is um, uh, not indifferently addressed, but through that hole in that built platform that unites the two towers at the top. I don't know if I expressed well what I feel, but I think they are very special towers. This is a, this is a very special... Uh, uh, architecture because of this third element, the, the in-betweenness, which takes a, a crystallized form uh, through these uh, diagonals that uh, they, I'm sure they have a function. They, they bring people uh, down and up to some rooms here, but, but the, the, the actual uh, uh, raison d'etre of, of what we see here is metaphysical. 
it's about the sky. It's not so much about the rooms around it. it. The hole is what matters here because through this hole, you see, you see in a way, you appreciate the sky even more than if, if this thing was not here and it would have been just a, you know, a, an uninterrupted view of the sky. I think it would have been less consequential and less dramatic and less meaningful even than uh, uh, in, 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 in the case that uh, Hiroshi Hara uh, built. It, it's an, I think it's a, it's a very interesting uh, way to show that beyond our corporate needs and our office towers and our prosaic uh, um, you know, uh, uh, needs, there is something else. And that is the clouds, the sky, the you know, the, the infinite of our imaginings and so on. I, I could go on and on trying to approximate what I feel when I see these two towers. These towers, again, without that part in the middle, would have been just other glass towers, office towers, tall as they are. Nothing special. But here, what see in the middle is what, what, what uh, differentiates them from other tall towers or office buildings. Look what is here. This is done for the gods, to put it uh, bluntly. And yes, there is some struggle here. Yes, it's the struggle between the humans and the gods. You know, and you can tell that there is a need for some effort and some contortions in order to arrive at the sky. So the architect became a philosopher and a poet because of that gesture here, there at the top. Otherwise, yes, two tall buildings with office offices and so on. But what is in between them is something else. I particularly like this picture, you know, which is... Uh, you can tell in this picture that what truly matters is not what is on the left and not is not what is on the right, but what is in the middle. And, and the fact that what is in the middle is actually an interruption. There is a barrier, a frontier between me looking upwards and what is above it. And that's why I kept reminding myself when I was a kid and I was visiting my grandmother and she had a small window, uh, you know, about, I don't know, 45 centimeters by 45 or 50 centimeters by 50 centimeters. So the world was not a glass wall like in any glass house on this world, in this world. But through that small window, my perception of the outside was intensified. And Exactly the same thing happens here through that hole. My perception of what is beyond it, meaning the sky and the clouds and the light, is intensified. What I'm trying to say is you don't need, you know, total transparency in order to have the feeling that you uh, merge with the outside. And here also, it's through that circle, the physical and metaphysical presence of the sky, of the celestial, you could even say of heavens, is amplified, is intensified. This is what I'm tempted to uh, feel and think. And then there is the journey towards it, you know, through these escalators, going towards it, which the processuality in itself means something as well. Now, oh, yes, the forms of the, the escalators uh, is, uh, you know, rather mundane and uh, predictable. It's true. But, but as a whole, <clears throat> I think the idea to connect these two towers in this way, without neglecting at all the, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, how to say, the transformational and the uh, the uh, 
Yes, the transformational journey towards what is what does not belong to the humans. The transcending aspects of architecture, because I see here a certain level of transcendence done through the measurable means of architecture. I have seen many dramatic pictures of this uh, part of this building, this, this tower, or these towers by Hiroshihara. Now, the fact that the clients were willing to pay for this is admirable, and it can, can be and should be applauded. It is as if, you know, you feel like saying, yes, these buildings belong to us. But life itself continues to be a mystery, and the relationship between the earth and the sky continues to be, uh, you know, uh, to transcend our, uh, our measurements. There is a beyond, and somehow this building says something about this beyond. Another good work, an interesting work by Hiroshi Hara. The floating garden, that's how they call it. Floating like le nuage, to use the words in French of Charles Baudelaire, the, the clouds. We remember, or I remember what uh, Charles Baudelaire wrote in uh, The Albatross, the beautiful poem where he says the poet can fly but cannot walk. And I, I think it is uh, true very often. The poet can fly but cannot walk. Well, this building, the two towers, left and right, uh, are about walking, about the pros of uh, you know financial speculations, corporate concerns, money, and so on. But the floating garden is about something else. It's about flying, floating. It's about the poet. It's about the, the poetry of architecture and the poetry of living, aware that above the earth, there is the sky. Not bad. I think you were able to read what I just read myself, although the writing is a little bit small. Hiroshihara. Now the Komaba campus to University of Tokyo. Like in other works by other Japanese architects, and not only Japanese, we find examples also in the Netherlands and other places. You know, the idea to bring the street within the building, the space of interaction. And you see here, it's, uh, well, we don't see too many people right now in this picture, but it's about connecting. I mean, even, uh, uh, you know, I mean, I can mention many architects who, did the same thing, trying to bring the outside inside, the street inside, and create an inner street within the building. And it's the same attempt to unite the opposites, to unite the outside with the inside. But in this case, the inside doesn't go, doesn't move, doesn't open up towards the outside, but the outside comes inside explicitly through bridges through the corridors open corridors to to through the the inner street within the building 
renderings the way at that time were done. The magic of architecture, and I don't know what he is doing here, is uh, drawing something, I guess. Uh, I don't know where I took this picture from, but uh, I do see the architect as a dreamer, as a poet. Okay, that's it. I'm not going to talk about Kazuo Shinohara today, but today was the day of, uh, of Hiroshi Hara because he was born on this day. Thank you. Well, I hope he was born on this day because I didn't write uh, the day when he was born and the day when he died. But either he was born on this day, the 9th of September, or he died on the 9th of September. Either way, we pay homage to him. Uh, thank you.